This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We work with some of the world's leading companies to help people get stuff done, but more importantly, to help people to make space for what matters. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Reverend Chris Lee. Chris is the author of the book, The OMG Effect, 60 Second Sermons to Live a Fuller Life. In this episode, we talk about him starting his 60 Second Sermons on Instagram and growing it into the huge following that he has today. And we also talk about owning your identity and what it takes to live a fuller and more productive life. And we also talk about dealing with difficult people and how it's important to have a tough skin and a soft heart. This is Chris Lee. So I'm with, do I call you Chris or Rev Chris or how do you like to be? Father Chris, no, Chris is fine. Chris is fine. (laughs) It's um, the first question. Everyone gets a little bit intimidated. They're like, uh, Rev- Reverend Christopher or uh, Father Father Chris? or uh, what? And I'm like, just just call me Chris. <laughs> but then um, part of the reason we're talking is that you have this uh, sort of persona, I guess, on Instagram of Rev Chris, right? Yeah, um, Rev Chris 7, yeah. And your 60 Second Sermons. And we're here to talk about your book, The OMG Effect, Woo-hoo! which is right here. You've got one, I've got one. You've got a copy there. Yeah. Um, Which I really enjoyed. And so the subtitle of the book is 60 Second Sermons to Help You Live a Fuller Life, which feels like it fits in really well with the uh, topic of this podcast. So welcome to Beyond Busy, first of all. Thank you very much. Um, What have you been doing so far with your morning? Like what's What have I been doing this morning? Oh, well, um, getting up with the girls. I've got two girls. So not a, not a bad wake up 6 30 wake up okay um with my daughters prepping them for school and then emails and then i had a zoom call with a new member of the church or at least it's a funny situation that we find ourselves in because we're on zoom at church right, and um, okay. there's been a lady who's been attending for about three months our church service and um she's never turned her camera on <laughs> and uh and she's new so she she just wanted to talk to me i i, I open up what i call like the vicar surgery on wednesday okay so i allow people to come and chat with me and and um and share or talk or whatever if they i'm available so uh, is that in normal times that's tea with vicar at your house is that yeah or, walks or you know pastoral chats or whatever yeah on lockdown it's zoom anyway so this this lady uh, who i've never met has been coming to our church for three months and um and so i was just talking to her about you know she was asking me stuff about our church and about anglicanism because she she comes from she's american and and um she found me through online stuff um, and then has been coming but wanted to know about the ins and outs of what it means to be an Anglican and if that's how she sees herself now she's been attending our church so just getting to know her a little bit and inform her a little bit about church and stuff yeah and I I know very little about that stuff my parents growing up were like involved in like evangelical churches but if you're an American Hmm. Anglicanism versus what what would they what's their sort of version of that uh, the, well, there's the Episcopalians out there, and okay. there is the Anglican Church in kind of out there, but right. um, it's more of you know it's a it, it, I suppose Anglicanism from an you know would be seen as from a non-denominational background would be seen as quite a structured and authoritative, kind of right. more similar okay. to a maybe a Catholic understanding. Oh uh, right, okay. But it's so broad. I mean, it's so broad. You can look exactly <laughs> like Catholic on one end, and then the far extreme of Anglicanism, you can look like, you know, any Pentecostal or a Baptist or, you know, we're so broad. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, So you're sort of straddling, straddling these two things. So you do, as you were talking there, have a congregation and you're a real life vicar. And then you have this online um, world of Instagram with 170,000 followers and your 60 second sermons, um, which I just watched a few this morning actually, and and, um, really enjoyed. 
Um, what was the, presumably you started as just a vicar with a congregation and then the Instagram thing developed after that. So just tell us yeah. about the history of how that developed. Well, I mean, gosh, it's kind of, you know, where do you start with these things? But I suppose get, trying to give you a more concise version is when I, when I became a vicar here, um, I moved to this church and it was kind of a small church, quite struggling. And, um, and they had about 12 people. <clears throat> and, and you're I, in West London, right? West London. Yeah. yeah. We're kind of on the border of Shepherd's Bush and Chiswick. Okay. Um, so I came here and I asked, I asked my, my brother-in-law, um, who's married to my wife's sister. So my sister's my wife's sister and her husband we asked them do you want to come live with us do you want to come and live with us and help us in this church they said yes they came and lived with us he was a youtuber um set up a youtube channel oh. um, very successful youtube channel um called korean englishman and jolly anyway they asked me to come on their youtube and so i came on their youtube and then uh over a period of time i was i became a popular guest and uh, I would talk about stuff online. I would come on in my collar. I, you know, it was, it's, it started <laughs> out as a YouTube uh, channel based in Korea, South Korea, where they would try Korean culture and food and stuff like that and get their friends to try it. And we comment. Yeah. On it. So I did that and I became a popular guest. And then they started a new YouTube channel called Jolly. And they asked me to come on and do kind of cultural reviews on things. Like I reviewed uh, music videos so things like Billie Eilish and Ariana Grande and BTS and all these kind of, you know, young people's cultural stuff that's going on in the world. And as a priest, come on and talk about it. And yeah. what do I think? And anyway, those things went viral and they went really big. And, you know, now we've got about 350, 400 million views on the, <laughs> on the, on the videos that I've been on. With yeah. them. And that led to a load of people moving towards my Instagram, finding me on Instagram. And then that led to me having the opportunity to have a platform in which I can talk about and encourage people in life and in an outlook on life and stuff like that. And uh, that then made me go, well, I've got this opportunity. What am I going to do with it? And so I started this thing called 60 Second Sermons. And then the 60 Second Sermons just hit a note with a lot of people. And suddenly it had its own growth and momentum and I got kind of weirdly national coverage and press. Yeah. I've been on Good Morning Britain and This Morning a couple of times, and I'm their local vicar. And yeah, um, and I just thought you're doing. Are you doing songs of praise soon, or has that just happened? I just did songs of praise, um, and uh, yeah, that was quite fun actually. And um, I was on that with Katie Piper, and yeah. Um, and yeah, so this kind of weird this kind of weird new ministry came along and landed in my lap and and suddenly I was you know being talked about as the internet's priest and the viral vicar and and it's all a bit weird because I'm like West London small church <laughs> and and certainly quite known around the world on the internet so um mm. yeah yeah there was a couple of passages from the book I just read as I said passages which I've never said to anyone before and that's because I'm obviously <laughs> talking to someone who reads the bible a lot <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, there was a bit in the book where it really hit the nail on the head around that where you say um you're talking about humble confidence which I want to come back to but sure. there's this little um line in there where you say uh you really admire people who don't actively seek the spotlight but you're comfortable when you find yourself in the spotlight. So is that is that something that you would uh, reflect on as your own experience? Yeah, I mean, I try, I try. I mean, I think a huge struggle for us all is ego, and um, I think you know it's a it's a it's a disease for humanity. Unfortunately, yeah. is our ego and satisfying our urges of ego and self, um, and um, the humble confidence thing comes through really this underlying theme I have for for how I see life in a way is you know what getting on to success like what is success what does it look like to be successful what does it look like to 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 live this fuller life and I think ultimately if you were to define it in a word I would say humility that if you mm. can hold humility in in massive success or massive loss or whatever, if you can be humble, I think that you live a much more fulfilled life. And 
the way I kind of talked about that in the book is is humble confidence to to because to be humble isn't to you know I think C.S. Lewis said something to be humble is not to think less of yourself but to think of yourself less yeah and the idea to be confident and at peace with who you are uh, no matter what the situation um I think that's a very powerful thing and a unique thing and something that I gravitate um as a person towards people who hold that and um it's it's rare in this world we either overcompensate or we undersell ourselves we're insecure or we're arrogant you know and all those things feed into each other but if you can hold a level of um humility i think humility is the is the kind of is is the mother of all other gifts um yeah. and yeah. um ego and pride are the opposite of that yeah um so yeah, I so we're like about 10 minutes that. in on Beyond Busy and we've covered success, ego and pride and humility already. So we're, we're, we're in good territory. Here with, <laughs> yeah, sure. Like well, it. we can keep going on to those things <laughs> I mean, more probably to say. but For yeah. sure. Well, let's talk about Instagram then. So 170,000 yeah. followers. And one of the things that you um, say in the book is the main sickness of our day is identity. Yeah. So let's talk about that. What, what do you mean by that, first of all? Gosh, I think I think the question of humanity, <laughs> I mean, to go big, you know, why not go big is who am I? Yeah. And uh, and in that, I obviously I'm a priest. Right. <laughs> Hello. Um, and I believe that that is informed by God and the divine. And so I think, you know, I'm also a, a Franciscan. Um, and so what that looks like is I there's a guy called St. Francis of Assisi and he was this amazing, um, amazing man who who kind of led a, in a sense, a church revolution um, to the teachings of of Jesus. And and in a time where the church was seen as this big fat cat and power, he went, well, this isn't right. the way that I think we should live life. It's more, it's more humility, loving the poor and service. And um, and he had this prayer, which was, Lord, teach me who I am, and teach me who you are. And I think. I think in a sense, it kind of, that's almost like a perfect prayer. I, I see our lives and I see the world and I see a, certainly a new generation, a younger generation, just struggling with this question. Who am I? Like, mm. where do I find my identity? And, and the world at the moment loves to shove down your throat what it, you know, what it thinks you should think about yourself. So, you know, social media, the, the, the pains and the struggles of social media are the fact that it, it it's it it almost loves to feed this sense of oh you are successful because you've got x amount of likes or you're not successful because you only have this amount of likes and we allow ourselves to be fed by this you know uh, this understanding of being popular or not or or being seen to have money and uh, or being seen to be like a bit of a like a playboy with all the women and you know money sex power these are the things that it's like oh this what's this is what makes you who you are and i think that is not the case you know our identity i see ultimately is a gift from god who says you are loved and ultimately my whole being is about trying to communicate to people who would listen that they are loved that their identity is not based on what they do or what other people say about them um or what they own it's about the fact that they've been created by a god who loves them and who says they are of value and that cuts through all the crap because yeah. it, it it just says it's almost outside of yourself. You cannot do anything to it. You are loved. Full stop. And if you can just accept that sense of love, which actually takes a great deal of humility to be able to accept that you are loved, not because of anything you've done or haven't done, but just because you are being created, it actually flattens you because you're like, I can't mm. fight. If you can get to a place where you can just accept that, it's very powerful um but you know it's like almost i i'm thinking images often and my brain works in a weird way so like i i feel like it's like standing under a waterfall you cannot fight it you can punch the water and try and push the water but ultimately if it's a, if you're under a waterfall you cannot you're just going to get drenched yeah and if people could just be drenched and just be like okay and feel that sense of the love of god that says you are loved and you're of value start from that point 
then I think life would be so much better. And I think ultimately that's where the church is kind of, you know, I love, I love the church, but there's been a lot of failure and we've, 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 we've missed Genesis one. So in Genesis one, God says, I, you know, he created the world and, 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 and he created humanity, you know, men and women. And he said, you are very good. And like, if we could start there, but often what we jump to as Christians, we jump to Genesis three and in Genesis three, we have the fall where, you know, the, the story of the serpent and Adam and Eve take the apple and they fall. And then, you know, in a sense, corruption, sin, selfishness enters the world. And the, sometimes the church has done and often is seen and, and, you know, the media portrays us as a judgment force. You know, we're the people that says you're bad and you're a sinner and da, 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 da. And we drill home this message that you're all rotten. When actually the start of the Bible is you are loved, you are yeah. good. And we need to get back to that. And once we're there, then everything will, it lines up so much better and, and we can feel more at peace. We can be less judgmental. We can show grace to ourselves, grace to others. We can be embedded from a place of humility that says, actually, it is dependent on who I am told I am by the one who created me. And that gives me freedom to accept that and also gives me freedom to accept the other person around me much more, you know, you know love God, love your neighbor. That's the teaching, right? Yeah. And if we start if- from that place, we could be better. Yeah, for sure. And it feels like there's something in that. So even as, a, you know, I, I, I'm an atheist, but I take that message as mm-hmm. like, you know, we should all start from this place of, of radical self-acceptance. And by yeah. doing that, we open ourselves much more up to, I guess, the opportunity to be able to help other people be of service, be mm-hmm. useful, like all these other things that Mm. you know really are like turbocharged when we understand who we are yeah and it's not that i'm saying like um like we're all perfect do you know what i mean it's it's the ability to accept your brokenness yeah your foolishness your silliness all of the stuff that we all struggle with and still say amongst all of this oh yeah i'm but i'm deeply loved yeah. And With I love that because you say that at the beginning of the book as well. Like I'm flawed, I screw up and all yeah. these, you know, all, all these things don't look at me as perfect. Yeah. And so like with contrasting that with Instagram then, right, which <laughs> is a yeah. platform that, you know, drives home perfection. It drives home an infinite set of wants, a mm. sense, you know, a kind of deep sense of you're not quite enough. You need to do more, be more, all this kind of stuff. So do you... Do you sometimes feel like there's um, too much of a contrast between what you're trying to say and the medium and the platform in which you're trying to say it? Is that is that ever an uncomfortable thing for you? Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't, it would be worrying, I suppose. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's probably a silly question. No, no. It, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question because um, it's really hard. It's like, it's, it's kind of like going out into the night to bring people back into the day, but you you kind of have to do that. You you like, I, I want to use the platforms in which people are in to communicate to them that they're, they're loved and precious. And I'd rather do that than, um, than, than not. And, you know, the church is missional because it believes it has this treasure and, and, you know, our joy is complete when others share in that treasure. And it's not, it, it can come across arrogant in our worldview because we, we don't like to, to get on the, on the idea that, Oh, I'm right. And you're wrong and stuff like that. But I don't know. I, I think like everyone is on social media, right? It's the average, the apparently, yeah. I mean, I've heard two studies. I heard one study said that the average, online social media is four hours a day and then i heard yesterday that someone said it was seven hours um wow. and really a day. yeah a day and i was like what wow. um and on my screen time on my phone <laughs> it's pretty bad but i you know i, I tell myself it's okay because i do emails and whatsapp and everything else on my phone but my screen time is like six hours you know at least mm. um so i uh i want to get on to the the places where the people are yeah and I want to then use that as best I can to send a message of positivity, of love. And, um, you know, I try with my Instagram to keep keep my ego out of it. And I'm 
I'm a human. I'm, you know, I struggle. I'm not like sitting on cloud nine floating around telling everyone, you know, what to do or anything like that. I, I know that I'm flawed. I've got a good community around me. I've got a, a good wife who's grounded, who tell me if I'm being stupid and foolish and posting a, a what does she call it? A, um, something, I don't know, a glorifying selfie of myself or something. Right. Okay. She'll, she'll, she'll pull me up on it. But I, I was going to ask actually, like, is there a, is there things that you do or certain behaviors where you notice the ego and you have to check yourself, but it sounds like you've got a good, uh, yeah. a good accountability partner in your wife there. Yeah. I mean, I think accountability and community is hugely important. I talk about that in the book, but, um, yeah. So basically I just think that I want to be in the platforms where everyone is. Yeah. And I, I know that social media is in itself a beast. I'm not, it's not just a neutral tool. It's an economic tool, you know, and there are a lot of dangers to social media and the addictive tendencies that you can get from it. And there is problems there. Um, but I also know that the church is starving for young people mm. and where the young people are is they are, they're online. So I want to go there and say, Hey guys, and point away from myself as much as I can and say, you know, you are beautiful. You are loved. You are precious. God is good. And he loves you and he's for you. Um, most people's Instagram in a sense point to themselves and look at my life and look how good it is and blah, blah, blah. And I try on the whole to point away and say, you know, point back to the person watching me. And a friend of mine was like, my Instagram is full of you know, bums and boobs. And then I come across your Instagram and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's nice. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he goes back, so probably. But I don't know. There's also one of your quotes in the book is something like, uh, he's the only priest that I can stand or something like that, which I just thought was really funny as well. Yeah, well, just people like, say that. The comments on my Instagram are, and the YouTube and stuff are always like, I'm not religious, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and do you, do you mind that? Like, so it feels like there's people who are consciously going to take some of the messages, but they, but they know that it's not going to convert them. So mm. it's, do you see that as you've still helped those people or do you still see, okay, I've still got work to do because my, my job here is to try and prophetize mm. and, and convert people. <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of don't, I don't know if I see myself as that's my job, you know, <laughs> I think like, I believe in God and I believe it's his work. I believe it's his responsibility through the work of the spirit to bring people to himself. It's not mine. It's mine to as much as I can communicate and encourage people to open themselves up to receiving yeah. him, in a way, but it's not my job to make them receive. And it's, um, or, you know, I'm not uh, trying to build up my, my, my Jesus bank account. <laughs> with with like amount, the amount of souls that I've saved. I, I think that, but I, I believe that there is truth in this. And, and, you know, in, in, in John, in, who was one of the disciples, he wrote that our joy is complete when we share this mm, because, yeah. you know, you'll, everyone knows that, you know, you're, if you're watching a film and it's amazing, you much prefer to be with a mate or a friend watching it together and and if if something happens, you want to go and tell someone this is this is and that's where your joy is complete because isolated by ourselves, you know we're made for a relationship as humans, and it it's we get more com- joy when we share a treasure with someone else. Yeah. So I think that you know so in a way maybe there's a selfish reason, but I'm trying to <laughs> trying to share that joy. But I don't know I I it's part of who I am. I'm made up this way. I think so. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I suppose one way you could look at the Bible is it's like one of the one of the original self help books, right? Like so, yeah. yeah. Um, whether you believe in the God part or not, there's so many just really, you know, common sense, philosophical, wise yeah. lessons in it. Yeah, I mean, there's some really tricky stuff as well. There's some weird it's stuff. It's like it's like, oh my god, how do I compute this God? I mean, yeah. if, you, if you want to be confused in your faith, just read the Bible. You know, it's a tough book. <laughs> But I, I think like general wisdom is there for everyone. If it's true wisdom, it, 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 there isn't a, in a sense, my understanding of, you know, humanity um, is that it's not like the Christians own this like place of, um, you know, a, a monopoly on truth. Uh, it's that there is 
God is is breathing humanity. He, he cares about humanity, you know, and all of us. And I suppose a good theology is a good anthropology. It's a good understanding mm, of humans yeah. and where we all come from. And so if there's wisdom, uh, there's truth. And I, my understanding would be if there's wisdom, if there's truth, then it's Christ. And it doesn't necessarily need to be named as Christ. But And someone might feel insulted that I would call it Christ, but hard truth. That's what I believe. So uh, yeah. I think you can find truth in other faiths and i think you can find truth in um uh in outside of the church but when i yeah because you've got like bits in your book where you talk about socrates you you also there's also roger federer and lots of other people i mean yeah who doesn't like roger federer if you don't like roger federer it's your problem basically yeah no i'm I'm, I'm totally (laughs) a fan i'm totally with you there um and you've got more followers on instagram than the archbishop of canterbury and the church of england combined right people so... love saying that quote i get that every time <laughs> it's because it's in your press release right yeah i know so I mean, penguin. Thing, Pe- penguin. <laughs> yeah. yeah but the thing so the thing about that is so i'm interested in what is what has been your relationship with the established church and the kind of establishment parts of the church are you helping them to get more engaged online do they see you as a threat are you are you kind of like their biggest ambassador like what's the what's the relationship there oh gosh maybe you should ask them i i mean i i <laughs> hope i hope they see me as an asset and um um are they not emailing you saying how do we get the same number of views as you and i i i, I mean I, later on i'm doing a uh, i'm doing a conference uh today at three o'clock where i'm talking about these kind of things. And I have been asked to speak at different events and I've offered my advice to okay. the digital team um, of the church of England and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, 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 you know, that one of the good things about the church, I suppose, is, is it doesn't just knee jerk react to success. Uh, there's a process, there's a discernment. And um, I think if they just flung open the doors and went, Hey, come on, you like lead everything. I think that would be worried Yeah, because true. you know, yeah. it's not, it's not a, just about um, perceived success. It's a, it's more of a, a long obedience in the same direction, you know, rather than a quick, Poof. but at the same time, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I hope uh, that, I can help. And, and I think the church sees me as a positive thing. Um, um, I'm, I'm, you know, going on TV and becoming a younger face. Yeah. I think, you know, the church can sometimes be perceived as a bit old, a bit distant and a little bit judgmental. And sometimes we haven't done ourselves favors as the church with that, but sometimes that's just the image that the media love to portray of us. Um, and it's not necessarily fair. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I I love the goodness of the church when it's good. It frustrates me, obviously, when it's not. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. Which I suppose is also because um, I've got a friend in the states who has a very similar view. So he and I was actually I'm going to share with him your thing about Saint Francis of Assisi because he is someone who's very uh, sort of anti the establishment of the church in the US, but is. I mean, I think of him as uh, just one of the most uh, purpose-driven mm. uh, spiritual people that I know. And he's, he, you know, I, I almost think of him as being someone who literally with every fiber of his being and every thought is thinking, what would Jesus do in this situation? Like he's, you know, really mm. conscious of mm. uh, having that very humble um, approach and kind of taking those lessons and stuff. So, yeah, I'm going to share. Quite, quite an intense character. Um, yeah, and he, but also he's um, he's very respectful. We have really lovely conversations about it because he's very respectful um, of my atheism, and I'm very respectful of his faith. And like we have these lovely mm. dialogues yeah. about it, which I really value. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes because he was actually on Beyond Busy before. He's called Derek Snook, okay. um, and he actually wrote a book which. Um, I'll send you a copy, Chris. He he uh, wrote this book about his time living in a homelessness host- homelessness hostel in in the states in Charleston, wow. South Carolina, to understand um, the issues that were going on there, and basically set up like a, I guess like a sort of employment agency to help people back into work, mm, sort of off amazing. the back of that and stuff. But he's just a hugely inspiring guy, anyway. Um, 
it definitely has that uh, sort of humble confidence that you're talking about before as well. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, if you can have the biggest church in the world or the most authority or whatever. If you, if you're not, if you're not caring for the oppressed, the, the outcast, the orphan, if you're not involved in some way in helping and loving the people who make other people uncomfortable and are hard to deal with and are a little bit on the outskirts and really you're, you're, you know, yeah. you're economically bust spiritually mm. in my opinion. Like you, we, the whole point of Jesus is including the outcast and yeah. saying that they, and that's because like coming back to my identity is because the identity of every single person is that they're, they are loved. They've just probably forgotten it, never been told it, been injured through it. And, you know, I see our role as the church is to, is to teach people that. It's like, it's why it's called the gospel. Gospel means good news. Mm, and the good yeah. news, you're loved and you're forgiven. Anyway. Cool. Um, I'm going to um, switch gears a little bit and cool. ask you about productivity. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so I've got, I've got a slightly cheeky question to start with on this is, how sure. do you think God would judge productivity? <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, Jesus, Jesus talked about this in terms of a parable of the, of the talents. Right. And, um, it's quite of a, a difficult one is, is, you know, he says that there are these three people and, um, one was given 10 silver coins and one was given five silver coins and one was given two silver coins or something. And, you know, the one with 10 invested it and, and built it up and, and made a, uh, you know, reap to harvest and the, the father goes well good and faithful servant well done the one with five you know doubled it and did well again he was told well done and the one with two buried it um because he was afraid um uh basically he was afraid whether losing it or whatever it was but you know he, he gets told by the the master um you've you know you're foolish you should have you should have at least invested it you should have done something with it and um, because you've you've done nothing with it, um, then what you have will be taken from you and given to the w- the wealthy one. And it's kind of a tough teaching. It's kind mm. of like there is an expectation that we have been we are gifted with yeah. with talents and gifts, and there is in a sense, you know, we have an we have the opportunity and means to. Um, increase those things um but having said that i think the main thing that i see is productivity is personal in a way personal growth um you know you know it you you know scripture says you know a tree by its fruit so what does what is the fruit of someone's life yeah you know and is it good works is it good character love joy humility patience kindness all of these is it though do you see those things in someone's life and if you see them then you that person's life will be fruitful Mm -hmm. Uh, now ultimately you can have not have that use there are some pretty dark and evil people who are in power positions of power um i mean look at america but um (laughs) you don't you that doesn't mean that they are um product you know so i don't sorry i don't know what i've kind of lost what i was saying there a little bit but um <laughs> so let's bring it back to the parable there so do you feel sure. like you have a bunch of skills and talents and assets in terms of time and energy and all these things and do you feel like it's your duty to to use those well yeah i, I think so it, it's i mean duty is a hard word isn't it it's like i think it's my right my privilege yeah. And based on my faith and understanding of who the character of God is, I want to lean into the gifts that I've been given and trust him. Mm. So I want to do that. Um, it, it, it does. Ex- I am excited by people who are successful in terms of how the world sees, you know, like financially, someone who's built up a business. You know, you know, I mean, we all have friends probably who are successful and it's interesting to be around them. You're like, wow, OK, what have you done here and how have you done that? It's interesting yeah. and exciting to hear how they've they've you know they've made a success of what they've been given and then you you know you've maybe got those friends or or relations who you who it seems don't and they just sit back and they become a in a sense victim of environment and um Mm. they are you know 
again, I mean, priests, I'll use scriptural language. They talk about a reed blowing in the wind and the idea that the wind just blows them wherever. Um, and they are, you know, always going, yeah. always being blown around. So I, I, I think there is an excitement to life that can lead us to, you know, travel or experience life or grow things and, and be productive. And I think that's a real gift of humanity. And I think one of the the things about being human is one of, you know, when it says that we're made in his image, it's creativity is who God is. He's creative. And as humans, one of the defining aspects of being a human more than animals is our ability to create endlessly, you know, yeah, and to sure. recognize beauty and to go, this is beautiful. And I want to create that, whether that's art or um even a good business financial structure that helps and lifts up employees as well as, you know, the world. Or I think there are, there is beauty to be had in productivity. So, um, yeah, I think, I think when, you know, what, you know, going back to God wants us to be productive. He's literally said that you like go out and produce and take care yeah, of the world. Right. And be you know, creative and be generous with that. Yeah. For sure. yeah. So um, yeah, I think that we should be. And there's a thing in the book that, uh, sort of hinted at your own style around sort of personal productivity. So you said that you ask yourself two questions at the end of the year. Oh yeah. And one is what's the most exciting thing or the most exciting situation or person that I've been involved with that year. And then what's been the most successful thing. So yeah. just wondering like, where did you come up with those questions and what are they, what do they mean? What's behind those questions for you? Well, uh, f- first I would say I, I didn't come up with them. I was on a retreat and someone said them to me and I was like, that's good. Ah, okay, cool. It blessed me. And I think, you know, any wisdom is borrowed wisdom. Wisdom mm. is there for all people. And so, um, I, like I said, I, it, I'm, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm not coming out with anything new. So if, but that's how many years it, have you been doing those, those questions? Just, a, just about three, three, three years. Okay. So, but yeah, I found that really powerful when this person said it, it was like, well, you know, looking back on this year, like reflection is a big thing in, in spirituality, like to be a reflective person, to sit in stillness and reflect, I think is a very powerful thing as a gift to us as humans to do it. So I think like being able to say to yourself, well, this last year, taking a moment and pausing, what, what has given me life? What has been the thing that I've like really been blessed through? And just sitting with that and um, and then, you know, what has been the thing that I've done that has seen life, that has seen life being produced either in a ministry or anything like that. Um, and and saying, OK, well, with those two things, do they link? Are they linked or are they not linked? And then asking, well, how do I see more of that? How do I see? You know, and I think in a way it's kind of what Steve Jobs did with apple he kind of went into apple and went where is life here yeah right and, what's, and, the, what's yeah. the fuse that i can just light up and it will what, what is the thing yeah. that is actually producing success and life and then he was quite brutal in his cutting of everything else yeah and he just went this is what we're going to do and i think you know that's it really it's about recognizing where life is and then sewing into that um mm. and and serving that um that's so, nice yeah. Mm. um one of the other topics that we talk about a lot on this podcast is work-life balance yeah and we kind of started this uh conversation with you saying hey if the doorbell goes like i'm a priest that's kind of an occupational hazard that's what happens so um how do you how do you switch off and how do you sort of manage that boundary the sort of i I guess it's a very blurred boundary for you between what's the the persona of you that's available to everybody else and the part of you that's available to every, everybody else versus the part of you that's, that's private and for you. Mm. I think coming back to that word humility, staying humble with an understanding that I am not the Messiah, right? I am not the savior. So uh, on a day off, it, uh, you know, I brutally will protect it. And if someone needs me, you know, I'm still going to be, okay, as to a degree, you know, if, if something absolutely tragic has happened, I'll, 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 I'll be there. But ultimately knowing that I'm not the Messiah, I don't need to do this, right? And they actually will be okay, or this situation will be okay yeah. without me. Like, so just staying humble with that and knowing that my calling first is not to my job or um, or anything else, but is to my wife and to my family, like... 
How ironic. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need to get that? Yeah, we, we didn't plan that. Uh, my, I'm sure my my wife will get and get that. Is that God calling, do you think? Yeah. I, so, <laughs> so uh, that's so funny. Um, he's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? Um, anyway, uh, so first and foremost is, is, is staying, you know, staying humble and going, actually, I need this. I need this for them. They need this for me. I need this for myself. Yeah. And I am more than what I do. So, um, you know, I talk about calling in the book a lot and where you find your calling and what your calling is and how to discover it and all of those things. But, you know, essentially at the very end of the of the of the chapter, I, I focus on the truth that you are more than your calling. Mm. You, are, you are more than what you're, you know, set in here to do. Um, and that obviously feeds back into this line of my whole kind of being, which is identity is is from God and says you're loved. Yeah. So it, you are more than what you do or what you want to do. And so being human and being present is an important thing. And the best me for my people, or my service or my church or whatever it is, is a full filled up me. So it's actually really valuable that I have downtime. It's, it's, it's actually good for my, you know, business, my ministry, that I am relaxed, that I am filled up, that I am happy um, because that will produce a productivity, you know, in, in, in my life. And in, yeah. in essence, that is what the Sabbath is biblically. It's about just going, you need to take a break. And actually taking a break is about um, being still, being present and allowing yourself to be fed again between you and God alone. And that will lead you to a fuller, more f- productive life in the rest of the week. So take a break. So yeah, I'm. I, I you know you should definitely take a break, and I am pretty good at that. Like I will plan yeah. holidays. I will, you know, I'm I'm not someone who gets built beat up by guilt too much, mm. and it's just a waste of emotion. So I'm just like, no, I'm going to take a break. Right? Yeah, I'm pretty good at um, evenings and weekends and protecting those uh, boundaries. But then I I do see it in a lot of people. Uh, who are struggling to take that Sabbath, right? And to yeah. and to really treat Saturday and Sunday as any different from a Monday to Friday. Uh, and it's quite popular know. at the moment to be like the person who's like, "You got to work, man. You got to work, yeah. work, work, and you you got to you got to push." And that's how you make it in life. And it's just like, whoa! Yeah. I actually don't. Ag- I don't think that's healthy. I, I I completely agree. It's that very sort of toxic hustle culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I sometimes for fun on Instagram, back to Instagram, I'll mm. follow like some of those sort of entrepreneur business type accounts. And man, some of the stuff that is being like sort of pushed on young people as here is how to succeed, I think is actually dangerous. I would go yeah. that far. I'd say it's dangerous, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And here is like my perceived wisdom. This is how yeah. it's like, oh, shut yeah. up. No, it's not. <laughs> you, know, yeah, for sure. you know, so much of life is is you know stumbling into something luckily, or and often that comes through having a stillness and a place that just le- you know you just fall into something. Like my success wasn't planned. Mm. You know, I think there's a lot of that that goes on, and this this idea that we're just all in charge of our own. Th- you know, I just humble yourself. No, you're not. I also love the idea that so you just went on youtube because you know uh your in-laws asked you to kind of thing and so almost like there's a there's something really beautiful about that sort of success for you happening by accident you know it's just yeah. and i think sometimes you know it's being me? they asked me to eat chicken <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he literally it's it's like here's his he gave me a beer and a piece of chicken yeah and i tried it and that was in a sense the start that that video has got like 18 19 million views <laughs> like me eating some chicken and you know subsequently that's led to you know all of this including and then if someone else listening to this said right i'm going to do a video of me eating chicken it would get like 10 views so it's right right there is a there is a mystery place. there is a mystery in the world and i think that's great yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's beautiful, and uh, I do think. Look, I do think you should work, and I think that you know there is a place for that, but there is also a place to remember you're human, and you're more than your work, and you're more than you know what success is defined as. Mm. You know, you you know you can, you just it's so amazing to, just and I think COVID as well is is 
is helping people to be more present. I mean, it's yeah. a hard situation, but you know, let's, there are some things that we can learn from this time. And I think one of them is being reminded of our fragility, our humanity. Um, in, you know, we're being our empathy for most part is being increased because we're suffering and we acknowledge the suffering of others when it's closer to us in a way. And, um, and I think we're being reminded to pause and to take stock and to see what the value is like friendships, relationship, family, these things are so vital. Um, yeah. and the, you know, the idols of the world of money, power, and sex are being a bit shaken because everything's slowed and, um, yeah, and just kind of economic consumption as well. Right. I, I mean, the title of this podcast is beyond busy yeah. and I feel like busyness is a really good mask and a good hiding place away from yeah. what you were just talking about there, fragility, mm-hmm. our own mortality, you know, mm-hmm. and so having all of that stuff stripped away you know, the travel, the entertainment, the consumption, all that stuff. It's like we are, you know, faced with with who we are much more, hmm. uh, you know, much more readily, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Who am I? Um, who are you? Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of other lines I wanted to touch about from the book, which I really loved. Um, you talk about uh, dealing with difficult people. Okay. And you say you try to deal with difficult people with a hard skin and a soft heart. Mm. just really resonated with me so tell us more about that i think i mean i mean i'm sure we've all had it you know people who say something to you you're like oh you're injured and you're angry and you're like oh and you know you 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 kind of it just it, they get to you in a way that is more powerful than what they've said and you're like you don't know mm. why and it's really it's it really just tiring exhausting to be around those kind of people. So I try to remember to be like my heart towards someone isn't um, defensive or angry. I try and remember again, coming back to this, that they are loved, even if they don't know it, even if they are, you know, this bully, but I try to remember the core, the deepest them is love. The deepest them is good. And they've just either forgotten it along the way or they've, it's been, you know, beaten out of them in some way. But I try and keep a soft heart. So my heart is, is in the right place with people. But then the first line of defense is the, is the skin, right? Don't let anything mm. get into my, you know, into um, that, into that, uh, uh, into to get through into my heart. So just try and just to have, a, in a sense, a the acknowledgement that the first layer is often superficial from people. So they're going to be angry, defensive or whatever. And just my, you know, it's looking at people with an attitude that is a right attitude so that they don't have dominance over you. Yeah. And, um, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a struggle. I mean, I don't always get it right. I still, you know, there's, there's people who make me feel more insecure than others. And that, and that speaks to my own insecurities. Like, and I'm like, Oh, why do I feel like that with that person? And, why do mm. I feel a pang of jealousy? And just being aware of what's going on in myself yeah. is 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 an important thing. But I, I think if you if you can have, you know, a soft heart and a hard skin rather than a hard heart and you're just angry and you're just like, you know, the defensiveness that leads to, oh, well, they're just an idiot, you know. And yeah. that is that that is that hard heart where you just are, like, oh, you know, I'm not gonna let their words in because they're an idiot and they're this and they're that. When actually the soft heart says, actually they are loved, but my skin says don't let that come through. You know, it's much mm. more gen- gentle and and from a place of confidence and security rather than a defensive place of having to like walls up against everyone. Yeah, but I love have that. Roots down and secure than walls up. Yeah, I love that. And it brings us, I guess, back to that thing of stillness and presence and reflection. Like if you have those kind of qualities in you, it's much easier to you know, to, to treat people in that way and to think about people in that way, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, a couple of final things then. So, um, no we talked about, um, productivity earlier and one of the lines in your book is the single minded pursuit of economic growth has left the world in bad shape, mm. which jumped off the page for me. Cause I was like, yes, I totally agree with this, but I'd love to hear more about your take on that. Oh, wow. I mean, it's it's i you know i mean i i get it. it's kind of idol idol worship in a way the idea that money and um, is the thing that provides you with with all everything else like security and 
um, happiness and 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 you know peace. And it's just a lie. And and mm. sometimes our capitalist tendency is to drive for you know um, drive for just the pursuit of more for more sake, and we don't stop. And the world at the moment is you know our economic and our political and our environmental kind of problems going on in the world it's all this drive non-stop for more and and without a sense of saying well is this right you know and um i don't want to get too political but you know you look at trump and he just in a sense epitomizes the weakness of the of you know can we still refer to it as the west but do you know what i mean like the weaknesses of our sometimes our culture and certainly American culture, which is, you know, power and um, masculinity um, and, and money. And, you know, you just see it and and you're just like, Oh, I'm tired of that, you know? And, Mm. um, and it's, it costs us so much um, to, to, to not just when we pursue endless capitalist growth for, for just its own sake, yeah and we think that it will be the thing that will drive us to greatness when it's actually the very thing that is driving us to destruction um yeah. and you know that narcissistic tendency for just me myself and i and more um is broken but it doesn't have to be and you know capitalism isn't evil it you know the understanding of growth and prosperity is not a bad thing But when it comes at the expense of everything else, that's when it's bad. When it doesn't take into consideration the way it injures, you know, developing world or the poor in our society. um, When it's just a selfish chase of a few at the top, that's when we're all damaged. So um, I think, you know, you see prophetic voices in the world coming out against it now and again. And, you know, the rise of Greta Thunberg, um, and you know the taking on the big power struggles and and you know it, you know a kind of systemic racism which like the black lives matter movement well these voices are raising up and saying you know enough it's it's mm. not okay guys and we need change and that change will take time and it will be difficult but we need change so um yeah i think uh it's. It, I think it also. It's in a weird way. It comes from an insecurity in each one of us that feels like at any moment it will be taken from us. It's like a child with a toy. You know, they they do it as much. They play with it. Play with it. Play yeah. with it. Because they're like worried at some point parents going to take it or siblings going to take it. And actually, if everyone was just be like, "It's yours. Chill out. You just can't." Yeah. Like, if everyone took a sense of ownership over the world in a way that was true rather than a selfish, "It's mine." You know, in a way that it is yours. So deal with it well. You know, and if we could be better at that, we'd be a lot happier and a lot more understanding of each other, I think. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know, I'm just spouting now. Yeah, no, that um, I think is just a really good um, summary and yeah, complete, completely agree with everything that you're saying there. And um, I do think there's um, there's some work to be done in challenging the idea that we should be measuring the success of things on the lines of economic growth. It feels yeah. to me like in business, that's just taken for granted that every company needs to grow. We need to grow and, you know, putting certain percentage figures on it the whole time. And it's, you know, it's actually just not a good measure of success or, mm. and it's certainly not a measure of happiness. And mm. yeah, I think it, it, it feels still like a very fringe mm. opinion to share that. But mm. um, I think, I think, you know, what gives me a little bit of hope is, as you're talking there about Greta Thunberg and Black Lives Matter, I don't think I'd really thought about it myself in that way before, but it feels like some of those voices are going to challenge that more and more. And I think, you know, as humanity, maybe we're on to something in terms of that becoming more of a mainstream view. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to finish with something a bit, a bit fun, which is um, the God Pod. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you may be a vicar, but you've got a good taste in music. So you've oh, got Tribe you. Called Quest and The Who and Billie Eilish and yeah. um, loads of good stuff in there. And um, one of, so firstly, just explain what the God Pod, pod is to start. So with. it was a random idea that I had. I, I basically, you know, in in the book, I, I've got I think, 12 chapters. And for me, I see, I see 
God in the world, our humanity, in our creativity, in our and I, I put a lens on that doesn't just say, oh, God's in church. It says that God is everywhere. And my Franciscan kind of spirituality speaks to me in that God is in the, the world around us, in creation, in artistic form. Mm. And so when I listen to or what, when I listen to music or watch films, I often have a, a, a filter or I'm open to the movement of God through those things. And um, so I get spoken to by secular film or, you know, by music powerfully. And I feel that's God moving me. So with that understanding, when I come into this book, I kind of was like, I said to Penguin, do you think that it would be okay to kind of produce like a playlist with a book? And they were like, what? And I was like, well, like, <laughs> a, like a, almost like a theme tune or something for the chapter. And they were like, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. And then I talked about it more and they were like, okay, yeah, we like the idea. So every chapter in the book has in a way like a theme music, a theme tune that in some way has spoken to me or speaks to me about something to do with that chapter or, yeah. you know, has spoken to me in a way um, that I, that it, it feels quite akin to uh, what I'm talking about in a weird way. And it's hard to articulate. I don't know. And you know, the way like sometimes pain can feel like a color. I don't know if I'm just being st- stupid, but you know, if you get whacked, it can feel like white. Yeah. You know? yeah. You know, like, like, there, there's a, there's a link in, in our beings that are, I feel is quite profound in a way that I can't articulate, but we're more than our, just our thinking brain. We're feeling in our body is important to the way we understand everything as well. So Music for me is a powerful embodiment of understanding in a way. And sometimes music and art speaks to me powerfully that makes sense that Mm. words don't necessarily articulate well. So I love music. I love film. I love listening to things and allowing it to speak to me. And so I thought, well, if I'm writing a book about self-help and stuff like that, well, why not put in music as well? And so could people get that playlist on Spotify then? Yeah, I did create yeah. it. Um, yeah, cool. I, I think it's called like the OMG Effect 60 Second Sermons or something. Okay, cool. We'll, uh, we'll but, put a link to it in the show notes. And um, yeah. one of the ones I didn't mention there is The Streets, which is just like one of my favorite albums of all time. You yeah. were in the video for a week Become yeah. Heroes. Yeah, I know, right? Classic. I met my that happen? So when I was at university in, um, the first time around, where I was basically smoking a lot of weed and missing lectures, um, before I, you know, came to the Lord, um, not that I'm judging the people that do that, but, you know, just <laughs> in those days where I was chasing skirts and all that, I, uh, I was going through a difficult time, but um, I was listening to a lot of music, different music. And, you know, one day this Mike Skinner was doing a music video uh in our in our in kingston where i was studying and and uh i was walking down the street and someone stopped me and said would you like to be in a music video and i was like uh let me see you know are you gonna pay me and they're like yes and i was like okay you know i'm a student what what else do i have to do uh so i went along and met mike skinner and uh shook his hand in a music video and um yeah, I, uh, I was in the video for Week Become Heroes, which is actually Amazing. a really powerful song. It's beautiful, and, that song. I love that song. Yeah, yeah. My favorite is probably Turn the Page. I yeah. So good. Um, but well, yeah, I, I spent it. a few I went to uni in Birmingham, and I'm from the Midlands. And so that line where he's like, the hazy fog over the bull ring, the lazy, ba- lazy, lazy ways way the birds sing, I'm just... Every time it's just goosebumps when, I, when that comes on. But yeah, yeah, I just thought it was amazing that you were in the, in, in the streets video. That was just a really funny yeah. thing to read. I actually DM'd him a while back and he responded on Instagram. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, yeah. I went to, I'll tell you one very quick story. Is I went to, they did their like reunion shows at Brixton Academy. I've never seen just so many people just utterly trashed at a gig before. It was just like, wow. it wow. was so different from any other gig. And I go to a lot of gigs, but it was just a whole different, sort of dy- dynamic <laughs> that's kind of you know part part of their bag i guess but it was, it was an amazing gig but there you go i thought i think when he was younger certainly i don't i don't listen to me so much of stuff but when he was younger I, I really felt it was quite a prophetic voice yeah um and for you know a young a generation i felt it felt for me as well i felt like this is a voice of someone who's really articulating able to put pinpoint a lot of the way that culture is and what yeah. we see yeah. and it, sure. you know that's what music does it brings it's in a way it's a psychology in and of itself. It helps you understand yourself 
and um it helped and you know what is psychology it basically counseling is is allowing the brain to untangle so you can understand a bit better and music can do that where you just understand oh yeah that is yeah. what i think and feel and know in some part of me but haven't been able to say it and when you yeah, get yeah. people like you know someone like mike skinner or other amazing artists that are able to speak deeply into you it's really helpful and that's why i really like Billie eilish now because i think she's that voice mm. for a lot of young people who are struggling with like mental health stuff and she's able to articulate the darkness and the beauty yeah. of sometimes that darkness in a way that is quite powerful and profound so true so, um i need to let you go because you got to get ready for your conference uh helping the oh, yeah. church of england to work out what to do on social media but yeah i just want to say a huge thank you for being on beyond busy it's just been a real pleasure and um do you want to let everyone know where they can get hold of you and follow you and get yeah the so and all that stuff? uh instagram is rev chris seven um on youtube you can just type in rev chris um and our videos of me will come up or um the videos that i'm usually on are with uh two channels called one is called korean englishman and the other is called jolly j-o-l-l-y cool. um and then the book omg effect lovely orange this orange is really nice nice uh, and orange yeah it's lovely and um you can get that basically most places like you know waterstones or amazon or other book retailers are available i did an audio version which is if you can deal with me talking to you for a long time <laughs> with that which is quite fun a bit weird you never know how bad at reading you are until you have to read on the microphone <laughs> um so i've always yeah. avoided doing mine yeah yeah and there so yeah you, oh yeah you've got your book haven't you yeah, I got someone else to to read it because I couldn't I couldn't face that. <laughs> yeah. Well, two days of nonstop reading. It's the most I've ever read in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been lovely chatting. Um we'll put links to all that in the show notes at getbeyondbusy.com and uh cool. thanks for being on Beyond Busy. Hey man, thanks, Graham. Bless you. This video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organisations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programmes and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You want to sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you want to buy some of my books? Or do you just want to find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.